On May 5th and 6th, 2019, the American Society of Civil Engineers presented a Civil Engineering History Symposium as part of the 150th anniversary celebration of the driving of the Golden Spike, completing the Transcontinental Railroad. As part of the celebration, there was a special tour of the California State Railroad Museum in Sacramento, California. All right, so where are we? We're in the Sierra Nevada mountains. It might be 1866, 1867. We're looking at a work train, which means this is a train hauling equipment for construction. Look, you can see the trees and the granite. Take a big, big, big breath. You can smell the pines and you can feel this rarefied air we're in. It's just wonderful to be here. The locomotive is huffing and puffing. We look to the right, we see a snow shed. We see some carpenter up on the top. He's looking at somebody. He's getting instructions from somebody telling him what to do. We've got a lot of work. Those of you that are familiar with California and you know where Interstate 80 is, you're looking at Donner Lake. We've just gone over to pass. We're dropping down, that's Donner Lake, on our way to Truckee. And this is the snow shed that we can say is the summit tunnel or a very, very specific snow shed. The very first operation of this locomotive happens November 9, 1863, glorious day. First operation railroad locomotive gets purchased by the genius businessman of all time, C.P. Huntington, in the East Coast. Things built in Philadelphia, puts it on a boat, ships around, buys it in March, shows up in October, put it on barges, got to get to Sacramento, shows up here in uh, November. They put it together, fire it up. How far do you think it went on its very first day? Very first day of operation. Ooh, you're optimistic. I like it. How far did it go? Very first day of operation. 100 feet. 100 feet. You're a little <laughs> pessimistic. <laughs> they got it on 1st Street, they got all the way to 6th Street because they didn't know how to adjust the thing. We've all started up new equipment, we've all bought new Blu-ray players, we've all plugged stuff in and it didn't work. Well, it didn't work. So they had to spend all night figuring out the adjustment, make it work. So the very next day, second day, November 10th, 1863, how far to go? How far to go? 20 miles. 20 miles, I like the optimism, very good. 20 is close to the right number, but uh, different um, modifier. It got all the way to 22nd Street. And why was that? That's as much rail as they had put down. <laughs> everything they had, everything they used, everything they needed came from the East Coast. Everything's being shipped around, shipped around, and so they get the first locomotives, they get the first rails, and really, a hey, young man, the first rails, all they get is enough is to build 22 blocks, and that's where they go. Well, they make it, uh, get your map of Interstate 80 out uh, today sometime or tonight. They make it all the way to Roseville in the middle of 1864. When they get to Roseville, California, which is only about 30 miles this way, they realize they need more people to build stuff. So they put an ad in the paper, 5,000 workers needed. <laughs> now, how many do you think showed up? 5,000 workers needed. 500. Middle of uh, about 500. They got about a tenth of what they wanted. So Charles Crocker, who was the associate in charge of construction, starts hiring Chinese laborers. Chinese laborers then were available because of tremendous discriminatory laws on the books that we talk about in this exhibit. So I invite you to come back and look at this, because look at this, gold rush discrimination, 5,000 laborers, who are the Chinese railroad workers? We tell their story very well in these panels. This is our homage and our honor of uh, showing uh, what the Chinese laborers did, and they just did the hard grunt work. You've all been on construction projects. I imagine, and the laborers move everything around. Today they use fancy little machines and they sit in air-conditioned cabs as they're driving all this equipment. But in the day, it was all done by hand. You see, we have this star chisel. Now, maybe some of you uh, had a summer job uh, working someplace where you got a chisel granite or something. So there's that chisel there. And so one of the Chinese laborers would hold the chisel against the rock. So he's holding on to the chisel. Two of his very best friends are on either side of him. Bam, bam, with sledgehammers, bam, bam. Every time it gets hit, turns it just a little bit, just a little bit. After maybe 30 minutes of this, you got a three inch hole. So what do you do? Well, you got black powder. That's what's in that keg right there. You fill that thing full of black powder. You light a fuse. You go to an area of safety. Blam! The rock then slumps. Now you guys are smart. You're civil engineers. You know why you don't want the rocks to go flying. You want the rocks to slump because you want to pick them up and put them in the cart. Because you got to build roadbed. So you've engineered this path 
so that you're only removing as much rock as you need to build road bed. You only want to move rock and dirt once, really, right? So you got to do this. So you don't want the rocks to go flying. And you do that, and you do that all day long, and maybe again six inches, eight inches or so. Look to your right, we see one of the long tunnels. 1,650 foot long tunnel. So if you're blasting this way, gaining maybe, I don't know, even a foot a day, how long does it take to drill a 1,650 foot long tunnel? Now don't do the math, because the answer is a long time. <laughs> now these guys are smart. They know where the exit of the tunnel is, because when you go in the other direction, it's the entrance. So now they go to the other side of the tunnel, they're blasting towards each other. Now my time is cut in half. So how long does it take? 1,600 foot tunnel. A long time. These guys are smart. They go to the top of the mountain, hard rock going down to the bottom where the roadbed's going to be, and now they're blasting out towards the entrances. So now my time is cut by a fourth. Even at that, it takes them over a year to drill this tunnel. Governor Stanford Oakmore, this is a real deal. This was given to Mrs. Stanford in 1895, and she decided to uh, ultimately uh, accept the thing. She died before they could do anything with it, sat in the field for a while, and then they put it into a little museum to the Stanfords, and that's where it sat uh, until um, really about the 1950s. Stanford needed the space, and they put this thing in a warehouse. The point of all this is, this becomes accessible or available to the state of California when this museum is being planned. So negotiations take place, here's a wonderful term. This locomotive is on permanent loan. <laughs> permanent loan in the state of California. When this thing becomes uh, you know, the control of the state of California, they treat it like an archeological object. And they get out the 800 grit sandpaper and they start working their way through the governor's campus because they want to know what's here, what's here, what's here. They work their way through, they find four separate types of fonts to say governor's campus. Look at what we got here. We got G, big G, little O, little B, period. That makes sense. Governor, abbreviation, oh, now we're all capitalized, period. Makes no sense. Why would you do this? Some of them that they found, all capital letters, no period. Some of them have lowercase letters, no period. This is known as Railroad Roman. So if you are into font collection and all of your Word documents, select Railroad Roman. <laughs> or the Southern Pacific Railroad actually had a font called Egyptian. Celebration all set for May. Look at this right here in the paper. This is an advertisement in the paper. Grand Railroad Celebration. Great National Railway across the continent, 8th day of May, 1869. Well, it gets to be about May 7th. Leland Stanford is at Promontory, and he realizes the Union Pacific isn't going to make it. They got a lot of problems, not the least of which is major storm blows through the center of the United States, wipes out a couple of their bridges. Big, scary thing. They can't run locomotives across. Their dignitaries are stuck. They can't get there. So Stanford <coughs> and crew decide we're just going to do it on Monday morning, May 10th, 1869. And then we've all seen this iconic picture here. But do we know well, why this is called the Russell Champagne photo? Russell Champagne has a bottle of champagne that this guy here is holding. <laughs> but this was the photograph taken a little bit after the ceremony. The ceremony is when we uh, drive these precious metal spikes, actually tap them. Now what begins you now is the largest celebration you can imagine. When that word done is received in every telegraph office in the United States, they light off whatever they can do that will make noise. Church bells, steam whistles. Here in Sacramento they tie down 20, 30, 40 steam engine whistles. Boom! Making big noise. We have steamboats going up and down the Sacramento River. Steamboat captains start playing their whistles and they start playing music, start trying to outdo each other. Huge parade going on. Big party happening here in Sacramento. What are we really saying? No matter where you live, if it's in the United States, you find a newspaper that's printed on May 11 or May 12, 1869, it will have a story about the Transcontinental Railroad being completed. Even in the day, it had 30 reporters at the site while this was going on. Now, many of the stories had to be sent by telegraph, so they're somewhat abbreviated, but there will be a story in your paper, no doubt about it. The railroads uh, became a part of every aspect of standard daily life in the United States very quickly. Look at this right here in this case. This is children's literature. My ABC of trains, John Wright's comrade, Tom Wright's comrade is the girl fireman, engine 66, 
my dad's the engineer, kids reading material became a, a subject uh, of, uh, of great uh, ability to get. Major denominations would buy chapel cars and they would run this chapel car, kind of like Elmer Gantry. They would go around the country and save the flocks. And there were 13, 14 of those built. Over here, if you all work for major corporations or not, realize that uh, the railroads treated their employees fairly well. They had a monthly magazine. How many uh, worked for anybody that had a monthly magazine to the employees? Well, I did for a while. The Southern Pacific Bulletin, we got the Santa Fe Magazine, Mile Post, which is the Western Pacific. And these are sort of the ephemera that one would get working for a major railroad. We see these retirement plaques and such. Southern Pacific Bulletin even had in it plans for houses. <laughs> Think about that. Why would the railroad give away a plan for a house? Well, the answer is they wanted you to get a mortgage, buy a house, and then there's a good chance you'd come to work on Monday morning. <laughs> be able to pay that mortgage off. So it's a matter of stability. The railroads really did take care of their employees as best they could for the time. Look behind you over here next to our Gold Coast coach. The railroads invented HMOs. If you live here in California, we think Kaiser invented the health maintenance organization. No, it was the railroads. You would take 15, 20 cents out of your paycheck, you'd go to the uh, uh, medical care, and then you would get the uh, medical care through the Southern Pacific Hospital Systems. Hmm. They wanted their employees to be healthy, they wanted them to come to work, they wanted to work, they wanted them to work reasonably hard and efficient, and then they paid them fairly well. Gonna look at my favorite artifact, and you folks are gonna love this, just love this. Well, when I got my chemical engineering degree in 1970, oh, so many years ago, I did all my calculations with this thing made out of three pieces of metal. And the piece in the middle will go back and forth and back, and I put 100,000 miles on that. And what is that known as? Slide roll. Slide roll. Very good. Look at this cylindrical device back here. That's a cylindrical slide roll, equivalent to a slide roll 33 feet long. So what is the railroad doing? Why do we need this extreme accuracy? It's all about laying out the track. Because the mathematics have been sorted out. You can get a degree in all things railroad from University of Pennsylvania. What, anybody from Purdue? What is the Purdue uh, nicknames? Boiler makers. And where are they making those boilers? Locomotives. All right. So what you're doing is you're laying out track. Because you want that passenger train to go 90 miles an hour, go through that curve, and not spill the martini in the bar car. That's what you want. High, high accuracy. Notice the roundhouse. You might think this is a real roundhouse that was here from the 1860s. No, as I mentioned earlier, this is a purposeful built museum. So look at the distance between the tracks. If this were a real roundhouse, it'd be a whole lot more crowded. That's because we want there to be space for the exhibits and for people to be able to enjoy the equipment. So when we get done with the tour, come back to the roundhouse, we have three cars that are open for your enjoyment. And there's the Pullman Sleeper. If you remember the movie, Some Like It Hot? There you go, that's the Pullman Sleeper. Got a dose in there to tell you all about it. Exit out the back end or to the west of the uh, Pullman Sleeper, come around into the Cochiti Diner. That was the super chief, high-end railroad travel, late uh, 30s, early 40s. That was the uh, railroad of Bismuth. Well, over here we have a rotary snow plow. So happy that's on exhibit, you can look at that. Railway post office car. Railroads haul the mail up until 1977, so we tell that story. Over here we have the C.P. Huntington. That was, uh, that's um, one of the first local, uh, actually number three from the Southern Pacific. Central Pacific got renamed number one from the Southern Pacific and it took an hour to tell that story. Somebody asked a question, what's the deal with the smokestacks? Smokestack is funnel shape, smokestack is funnel shape. What we're doing is we're burning wood and that's a cyclone separator. Got to get rid of the sparks. Uh, they don't want to light off the forest on fire. So what you're seeing there is that's a spark arrestor. Whereas coal, coal because it's clinkers, isn't going to blow up so much. So the coal stacks are much more uh, yeah, much more still pipey. You're looking down the side of uh, one of the largest locomotives that ever operated here Ooh. on the West Coast. This is Ooh. the Southern Pacific Cab Ford, called Cab Ford, which is the cabs in front, built backwards. Cabs in front, because as we pointed out uh, in the Sierra scene, Central Pacific Railroad had to go through a lot of tunnels. 
So when you got a giant locomotive putting out a lot of steam and smoke, what happens to all that steam and smoke as you're into the tunnel? Right into the cab. So the solution is put the cab in front. That's where it is. Far end, uh, the back end of the uh, locomotive is the duplicate gold spike. When the official gold spike was made representing the state of California, given to Governor Stanford, taking the promontory, the man that made that made two, made a spare. He kept it in the family for a long time, it was rumored to be existent. It became available, the state of California acquired that in 2005, so we have that on display. So it'll show you what this gold spike actually looked like. We got it in a bulletproof ATM style case. Anybody ever gone to the archives and seen what the Declaration of Independence is in? This is what this thing is in, same thing. And, we have the Judah map.